So hello everyone and welcome to the My Secret Life series where we give you an inside look at otherwise successful people who were hiding something from the outside world. In this interview you will find out the what, the why, and the how they came out of the darkness and into the light and we are so glad to have you here today Dr. Bill Pettit and we would love um, to introduce our special guest. Leah, would you want to say a few words to Dr. Bill before we get started into the interview? Yeah, actually, um, we're really grateful to have you here. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, what's so exciting today is that Actually, Dr. Bill Petit worked um, for over 30 years in the field of psychiatry, and he worked from this understanding, from the, this understanding we are always talking about from the three principles. And he was a student of Sidney Banks as well. And this understanding not only changed his life, um, dramatically, but also the life of hundreds of um, people he worked with during his life. And he is still um, working now in a different kind of setting, but um, supporting the sharing of the three principles in the world and as a still um, with his huge knowledge and uh, yeah, big heart that we could see and feel whenever we were lucky enough to hear him. So welcome, Bill, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So we're just starting and what we are always doing is kind of looking um, in a period of your life when things looked different and were kind of dark and you didn't feel whole and um, you felt probably broken or different than the other people around you. So could, could you tell us a little bit about this time? Sure, I, I'd be more than happy to. Um... The setting that um, that I met Mr. Banks was April Fool's Day of 1983. So I'll, I'll go back about at that time. I was I had left psychiatry uh, about three years before because I I didn't see people getting well. I saw with medications that often one could dampen the symptoms and give people some relief from excruciating depression, anxiety, frightening hallucinations. But I realized at some level that I didn't have anything or very much beyond that, except, except my caring, which is powerful uh, to care for people and to listen and to try to understand um, their experience and, and the pain that they're having. And I, I realized that I was helping people sometimes through things, but the metaphor that comes to mind was even when I did that, it was if, if I was giving them a fish so they didn't starve. But I, I didn't know how to teach them how to fish. And in fact, I didn't know myself. The day that I sat in front of Mr. Banks with 200 other people in San Francisco, I had been going in and out of depression for over 20 years. I myself had been in, in psychiatry for nearly 10 years, 
counting my residency at the time. I was board certified in psychiatry. <clears throat> I'd had 800 to 900 lectures on mental illness and medications. And I had had zero lectures on mental health. Mm -hmm. And yet when I became board certified, which I had both oral exams and written exams, they declared that I was now a certified mental health professional. Is that not fascinating? That would be like certifying somebody as an electrician and they'd never had one course or lecture on electricity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard to believe mm. when I present it that way. I myself, I said, I said, had seen six different psychiatrists at different times in my life. They were caring people. They were good people. And they walked me through and supported me through some very difficult times in college, in medical school, in my residency, in my marriage after residency in the, in the US Navy when I got drafted during the Vietnam War as a physician. Six different people, but not one of them said anything close to what Sidney Banks said in the first 30 minutes that I said in his presence. Not one of them awakened a hope inside of me that I was not broken, that there was nothing lacking. Up until that day, April 1st, 1983, even when I was not in a depression, the metaphor that used to come to me, it was like a black cloud that walked about two feet behind me and said, Pettit, you better not get arrogant because I can have your ass anytime I want it. So on the outside, I looked successful. I had been chief of psychiatry at the nuclear submarine base in, in uh, Groton, New London, Connecticut. And yet I had failed in my marriage. I was divorced after nine years. I had two small children back on the East Coast that I arranged to have one week where I, oh, I, I didn't say that I had left left the Navy after nine years and, and I j joined a company that taught um, experiential through experiential education. This is 1980s, 80 to 83. And it was the gestalt. It was the only way out is through. And I, I did trainings in uh, week long trainings from 10 in the morning or noon at noon till 2 a.m. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and 10 to 6 on Sunday. And we had processes that after the process, it was deemed a successful process. If you had multiple people sobbing, two or three people vomiting into bags, and maybe at least one person at least um, kind of dissociating temporarily because it meant they were really getting in touch with their feelings. Mm. Now, I believe that you could put a gun to my head right now and I would not do what made sense to me to do 
during that two and a half years, three years. But I did not know any better. We only see what we see when we see it. Mm -hmm. Does not exist for us in our experience, in our life, until we see it. And I loved the metaphor that I believe, Leah, I, I, I may be wrong, which one of you used it of coming out of the, out of the cave, out of the darkness. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's important for people to know that when we come out of the cave, out, out of the darkness and have some light, this will be a repetitive process mm. if you continue the journey. And each time that occurs, we have a choice between two Gs. One is to look back into the cave and, and be overcome with guilt and grief over the things we knocked over and broke while we were in the darkness. The alternative is to turn the other way towards the light and be filled with gratitude mm -hmm. that somehow we now have some light. Mm -hmm. My experience is that when, when I choose gratitude, the light seems to effortlessly get brighter mm -hmm. and allows me to continue a journey forward to the degree I get into grief and guilt about I wish I would have known this before and the, my first marriage would have been different, my mm. parenting of my children would have been different, my whole list of things. My experience when I do that is that the dimmer starts dimming the light and I start heading back towards darkness. It's not a should, there's no shoulds in this. Tell people it's not good to should on yourself. It's messy. But there is, there is a healthy way that leads to more joy, more love, more ability to give and receive love, more presence, in our life, more access to a wisdom beyond our intellect that, mm. that literally guides us moment to moment, every moment of our life, if we're willing to listen and be quiet enough to hear it. Mm. So I was doing these trainings throughout the United States and New York and Washington DC and Philadelphia and Seattle and San Jose and Phoenix and Denver and even did one in Tokyo, Japan and Canada. And, and yet inside I was still struggling. I was still a lost soul, if you will. So was doing the best that I knew, was trying to do the next right thing or the right thing next each moment of my life. But I probably was spending six to nine hours a day in some form of stressful thinking. Mm -hmm. I have a little form, which I'd be glad to send you. It's called the the Patsy, the Petted Attachment to Thought Content Scale. It's only by accident that my first girlfriend in fourth grade was named Patsy. <laughs> um, because in the mid-1990s, I started to realize that people innocently, if this really is the default setting, 
mental well-being, love and understanding. And that's truly what's behind life. Love and understanding, not judgment and punishment. No, I'm not asking anybody to change their beliefs about what's at the source of life. But I think there's pretty overwhelming evidence once one starts to look beyond be beliefs to evidence that what's behind life is, is pure love and understanding. And that that's the default setting of every human being on earth. Prior to an innocent lack of understanding of how what's behind creation, what's available to us and, and how our experience is created. Mm -hmm. So to go to what I started to see, as I sat there that day and I, um, a psychologist, Billy Hutcherson, for all I know he's on this, but um, he was sitting next to me by accident that day, if there is such a thing as accidents or coincidences. Um, and he's been a friend, obviously, for 38 years since then. But within 30 minutes, um, I knew I had heard something that was going to change my life. Now, I already had some hope awakened because I had met George Pransky about uh, two months before, and I had listened to him at a we had lunch together or brunch together and for two hours he spoke and he spoke of how his life had been changed by meeting this welder with a ninth grade education who was born in Scotland. And, and I, I spent enough time with George that I knew that he, there was something there. I, I had no idea what it was, but I saw enough that it moved me to come invest the time and money of that day to listen to Sid. And I had the experience that I was at that moment that I was not broken and there was nothing lacking. That was powerful. I knew that I was whole. I knew that there was just some things I didn't understand. But I saw that figuratively, my depression, if you will, in the metaphor of a headache, had been caused by me doing this to myself mm -hmm. with my thinking six to nine hours a day with worry, guilt, resentment, upset, drivenness, um, you name it. And then wondering at the end of the day, why figuratively I had a throbbing headache on the mm -hmm. right side of my head. Mm -hmm. yeah. I saw that every experience of stress I had, I got a glimpse, was created by me. Now, the depth at which I've seen that has incrementally increased through the years to where now, after 38 years, there is no doubt in my mind that if I experience emotional pain or emotional distress, and I'm not saying I never do, it's certainly so much rarer than it was, was, was my home base for many years, for 41 years. But even when and if it occurs now, I know the only person that can be the creator of that emotional pain is in the same underbridge as I'm in. <laughs> and the last time I looked, there's only room for me. Now, some people say, well, wasn't that a sad thing to find out that you've been the cause of all your pain? Wow most exciting thing I ever realized in my entire life. Mm. Because I thought that all my stress and pain 
were caused by things that I had no control over. Mm -hmm. By external circumstances, by things that happened, by things that other people said and did. So I went through life in a constant state of anxiety at some level, wondering who was going to take away my good feelings. It, it, even if I was feeling them, that they, they couldn't last very long because they weren't in my control. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was like Pinocchio, the puppet that I had handed out strings mm -hmm. to many, many people and things. And then when life or people pulled on the strings, mm -hmm. I had no control over the movements and the dance that I did, whether it was anger or shame or guilt or resentment. So what are some of the first things that I started to see? I, I, did you want to ask a question? I'm sorry. Yeah, just let you right there. Actually, it's what I wanted to point at. Like a lot of people that are here now or listening to this are kind of 30 years or 38 years back. They start to see, they start to feel, they start to feel the hope. And what I heard you say is just this tiny bit of hope was enough. Yeah, without hope, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And and Leah, that reminds me that if you ever see resistance in somebody or you, you label people's not openness, the only thing, resistance 100% of the time in my experience, is lack of hope. Mm -hmm. It's lack of hope. It's lack of hope because people have tried everything that everybody told them to do and worked very hard at it, and it hasn't done diddly squat. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you translate that. <laughs> That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> I'm sure you'll find a way. Um, and so, you know, they're reluctant to try again because it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it is lack of hope. It's lack of hope. And to me, when I experience that, that's the time for me to listen and love, mm -hmm. listen and love, listen and love. And then I, as Sid said, if you listen with a deep enough heart, you will see where to turn the key. Mm -hmm and unlock the soul, unlock the heart. Mm -hmm. There's a misunderstanding, I think, that gets, that has gotten into the three principles community that you don't listen to people's story. That's nonsense. If people have a real need to have their story heard, mm -hmm. Sid says you listen like a good neighbor mm -hmm. with an open heart you listen, you listen with an open heart. And then because people, when they feel truly listened to, that's when they're open to listening. Mm -hmm. But until then, and part of that is because people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. Whether they're eight or 88, it does not matter. Mm -hmm. So the one of the first things I got a glimpse of was that I was indeed creating my, that all my feelings, I didn't see that all of them, but I started to see that at the beginning, a lot of my feelings were created by my thinking. Mm -hmm. Now I know it's all, but but I, at the beginning, I started to see that. The second thing I saw and have seen incrementally is separate realities. Mm. That every one of us is, has different information stored in our computer, our brain, so that we perceive the world in a unique way. And for the first 10 years of the marriage to my late wife, 
it was a constant battle of who was right mm. instead of listening to each other and learning about the world that the other one lived in i was so fortunate that three year that after three years my late wife gave me another chance and we spent 18 years incrementally getting closer for mm. until she passed away in uh, in 2000 and uh, three years later I on Valentine's Day my present wife Linda who also had been widowed about three years came to speak on the healing power of unconditional love mm -hmm. on Valentine's Day at the West Virginia Medical School and we got married nine months later mm -hmm. and have our 18th 18th anniversary coming up. So I saw that I and you know the first four I really see that that I don't know if they're in the same order but I started to see the first four steps the first four lessons in Krista Campbell's my guide inside which has been translated now for children into a number of and and there is i heart and there's the spark inside it's all it's wonderful that they're trying to put this out to children but i i saw that the number one lesson is that and is that you have a guide inside we are guided by the same spiritual powerful intelligence that keeps that grows the flowers that has my lemon tree in the backyard produce lemons every year that makes the grass grow that has knows the the moths know when to go down to Pan, down to mexico here in the united states mm -hmm. the the birds every we are guided yes the only difference between us and 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 the, and the flowers and the birds and the animals is that we have the power to reject that guidance we have the power to instead listen to our own thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not that our thinking is the enemy. It's not. Our personal intellect is an incredible gift. If I go to a doctor, I want a doctor, man or woman, to have studied medicine. <laughs> I want them to be in a nice feeling, but I want them to have some, something in their computer to draw upon and use with wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think people somehow think that the personal intellect is something you have to be in battle with, or you, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the roommate you can't evict. Well, that's not true. It's a beautiful gift. But you can tell, so, I'll, well, I guess we're going to do the, um, the others later, the, the love letters. But so I started to see that my, I started to think, seeing that I had a guide inside, mm -hmm. if I would listen to it. I started to see that my Thoughts created my feelings. Mm. Well, that was huge because I always thought it was what you just called me or the gesture you just made to me or what just happened. Uh, I, I saw that happiness was inside of me. Happiness was inside of me. It was not in having a pretty girl or woman think I was neat or, or winning a tennis match or mm. getting a high score on a medical exam. It was inside of me. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I could notice that my thinking was fast and furious. Mm -hmm. And then I could allow it to slow down and become calm and curious. I didn't know that there were, when I didn't know what to do, that there was an alternative to anal analysis, 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 paralysis. There's a movie maker in the United States who many years ago made a movie. And in it, he was the character in the movie, the main character. And he had been asleep for 25 years. It's called The Sleeper. And when he woke up and he realized he'd been asleep for 25 years, do you know, do you, have you heard me say what he said, Leah? No. <laughs> After he realized he'd been asleep for 25 years and he said oh my gosh I could have been halfway through my analysis <laughs> mm -hmm. because the analytical gift is a beautiful gift for me it works about four percent of my life mm -hmm. 
The other 96% of the time is about being present with an open heart and an open mind. Mm -hmm. And I used to use analysis at least 96% of the time yeah. instead of 4% yes. and wonder why I went round and round and round, mm. and round in circles. So I, I don't know if this is a place to stop here. Mm. Yeah. A wonderful place. Yeah, Leah, did you want to? Yeah, I just would love to just hear a little bit how it started to change for you in your real life from kind of being depressed but successful and really not feeling well into a totally different experience of life after you started to see what you've seen. Just to give the people out there hope sure. and sure. Yeah. you know one of the things mr banks um said and he was my mentor for 26 years i was very fortunate is that there's an infinite number of doors of understanding of these principles infinite that's a last i looked at my math book that's a really really big number <laughs> right I say that because it's, I think sometimes people, when they first get a glimpse of the principles, it, they think it's like riding a bicycle. Like, oh, now I know how to ride the bicycle. Mm -hmm. Or I know how to swim. If, if you learn how to swim, once you learn how to swim, you, it's hard to jump in the water and pretend that you don't know how to swim. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you do. Or once you know how to read, or once you know how to add. But once you know how to ride a bicycle, it's very hard to get on a bicycle and crash the bicycle and by pretending that you don't, because yes. you know how to, it's against what you know. Well, this is more incremental. I started to become more aware when I remember one morning I was in my car and I had at the first, we, we didn't have the phones we have now. This is in the 80s. But I had a car in my a phone in my car, which was unheard of three mm. years before that. This is the mid. And within 20 minutes, I had gotten calls from four nurses. And all four of the calls did not end up well, with phones being slammed down. Mm. And I'm thinking, I won't say the names that I attached to these women. But I'm thinking they're the ones that caused this. And then a little voice came to me and said, do you think you might have had something to do with this? Mm -hmm. And I called back each one of those four nurses. And I said, let me listen. I don't think I listened well. Mm -hmm. Let me see what I can do. And I apologize for the way I was. Now, at least three of the four told me later they never had a doctor apologize to them mm -hmm. for his behavior. Mm -hmm. So I started to get a glimpse mm -hmm. that what I was doing with my thinking and then the way I was acting out of my thinking when I wasn't in a peaceful state of mind didn't bode well for relationships. Mm -hmm. In my marriage, as I kind of alluded to, I started to, when, when my wife and I saw things really differently, I, I, I got more open to let me listen so I can understand mm -hmm. what you see, because this is the person that I love with is, as much as I have ever loved anyone. And, and why would I not respect her by listening to mm -hmm. try to understand what she's seeing that I don't see? And as I started to do that, whether that was with my wife or with people at work, my colleagues, my world got bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got, I got less, it was less, less and less important to be right about things. Mm -hmm. It was to find, find to under an understanding that allowed us to keep a good feeling in the relationship, whether it was at work or at home or wherever it was, or with my children. Mm -hmm. There were times I had to say no to my children, but I, I, I listened in a way that I'd never listened to before. Mm. And, and I'm embarrassed to say that when I first learned this, I had an eight and a six-year-old, six, yeah. And 
the eight-year-old had hit the six-year-old pretty hard. And so I was spanking the eight-year-old and about the third spank on the bottom, I thought, wait a minute, what I'm teaching is that the biggest person gets to do the hitting. Mm. And my hand stopped. And I never touched my child again in violence, mm. any of my four children. So I started to, to value living in a nice feeling. And I didn't get frightened. I think this is a huge one, Leah and, and Chilia. I didn't get frightened when I didn't have a bad, when, I had, when I'd lost that feeling. Mm. I didn't get frightened. Mm -hmm. Because what happened, I used to get frightened. I'd say, oh my God, I'm kind of, you know, I'd label it dysthymic. I'm, I'm, my mood's going down. Oh no. Mm. Oh my God, it's going down further. Oh my God, I, what if I'm headed for another one of those damn depressed? Oh, uh, uh, and then I'd end up down there. I'd mm -hmm. say, see, I was right. Mm -hmm. And instead, what happened if I woke up in a low mood, I suspected that I probably was thinking about something the night before. And I'd take a look and see if, if, see if I saw it. And if not, instead of saying, oh my gosh, I'd say, this won't last. Mm -hmm. I don't feed it because my, I started to see that my mental well-being was like a good-sized cork. Mm -hmm. Its home is on the surface. And yes, I can with effort, but it takes continuous effort, push the cork down. Mm -hmm. I can get caught up in a circle of negative thinking and lower my mood. But once I let go of that and just get present as best as I can, somebody asked me the other day, what do you do when you're in a thought thunderstorm? And I said, you know, what came out of my mouth was I do the best that I can to be where I am. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be present in your life and in your thoughts at the same time. It's impossible. Yeah. My late <laughs> wife, my late wife, Sue, who I think, have you folks seen her book of poetry? Mm -hmm. The 65 yeah. pages? No? Yes, or yes. yes. Yeah. That was written over a weekend, you know, 65 mm -hmm. pages of rhymed poetry in iambic pentameter it was written over a weekend after we had adopted our second little girl. And, and she said to me, within a few weeks, she said of my internship at Coral Gables, Florida, with Roger Mills and Rick Suarez and Kim Cadu, she said, Bill, I think I've seen something. And I, what, I said, what is that, honey? She said, I see that moment to moment in my life, I'm in one of two places. I'm either in my life or I'm in my thoughts. Yes, yes, yes. Now, doesn't mean that when if you see children playing they're thinking but they're not in their thoughts mm -hmm. and when you and i are at play and totally present we're thinking but we're not in our thoughts we're in our life mm -hmm. so i i don't know if that's helpful yes. thank you that's so wonderful mm -hmm. thank you so much for that Leah, i'm going to close off this interview if that's yes. all right yeah perfect thank you so much um and for everybody listening to the My Secret Life interview series, we thank you for your time and attention today. And we very much hope that you heard something new and fresh that will waken you up to being in your life mm -hmm. even more every day. We hope to see you on the next interviews in the series. And thank you, Dr. Bill Pettit, for coming today and being our interview partner. And we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye.